All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I am delighted to uh, welcome you here. My name is Stan Voiger, Senior Fellow here at AEI. Um, and uh, today I'll be hosting uh, Yasha Mauk for a discussion of his new book, The Identity Trap, of which I am holding a copy right here, a story of ideas and power in our time. Uh, get your copy while you can. I believe supplies are running low, Yasha. Has that situation been resolved? Um, anyway, so a warm welcome as well to our online viewership um, uh, behind the camera somewhere. If you are one of the online viewers, you can submit questions to uh, Beatrice.lee at AEI.org or via Twitter with hashtag AskAIEcon. I'm pretty sure if you use that hashtag, you will, your, your question will be answered because you'll be the first person to have ever used it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but so please, please do that. If you're here in the audience, we'll do Q&A uh, in a bit, and so you'll have a chance to ask your question directly. Um, now, debates over identity, minority rights, and the meaning of social justice remain heated as ever, uh, certainly this past week. Um, their prominent presence in academia, in public discourse, in public debate uh, underscore their importance and relevance to a wide range of political and social questions. Uh, in his new book, Yasha, uh, Dr. Maunk, argues that in recent decades, these debates uh, have been dominated by an unhealthy focus on group identity uh, at the expense of universalist ideals, driven by what he refers to as the identity synthesis. Um, I look forward to hearing him present his book, but let me first sketch out the run of show for today. Uh, after Yasha talks about his book, we're, we'll, be, we'll be here on stage, the five of us having a conversation. Um, uh, that's, that's Yasha, me, and my colleagues Yuval Levin, Christine Rosen and Jenna Story will have a conversation about the book, about the ideas, uh, old and new, that it engages with. Um, and then we'll take questions from all of you and from our online audience. Um, now, with that, uh, let me introduce Yasha. Yasha is uh, a professor of the, of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University, I believe both in Baltimore and here in the District of Columbia in uh, the new building that used to be the museum. Uh, he just told me his office used to be in I thought he was joking when he said it was the old East German embassy here down the block, but apparently it was actually the old, it certainly looked like the old East German embassy, but it apparently uh, was that no longer, now he's in a museum and it's very nice and fancy. Um, he uh, uh, is also a contributing editor at The Atlantic. He's a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a Moynihan Public Fellow at City College. Founder of Persuasion, the host of the Good Fight podcast and served as, serves as a uh, publisher at Die Zeit. A lot, of, a lot of jobs. Um, he's also the author of five books, including two previous ones featured here at book events at the American Enterprise Institute, of which you can probably find video footage on the internet. Um, those two books are The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, and The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. Um, with that, Yasha, welcome. Uh, thank you for doing this, and please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's lovely to be here. It does give me a slight sense of uh, deja vu. I come here to hear really interesting talks by uh, fellows at AEI uh, to launch uh, my books now for the third time at the general invitation, generous invitation of Stan and to comment on Dutch general elections also at the invitation of Stan, which I know nothing about. So I, I somehow my, my, I, I feel like we were, we're looking at charts of parties that I pretend to know something about, but that is not what we're here for today. Um, uh, so I think I'm going to talk relatively briefly for about 10 minutes just to sketch out some of the main themes of the book, and then, uh, as is now tradition, I look forward to having my argument taken apart by the distinguished uh, panelists, and then I'll try and uh, take apart their responses to my book uh, as best I can, and I really look forward to a broader conversation. Um, so I like to say that I'm a uh, democracy crisis hipster. I was worried about the crisis of democracy and the threat of far-right populists uh, since before it was cool. I remain very worried about that. Um, uh, but uh, this book is about a very different topic, which is the new set of ideas about race, gender, and sexual orientation that have become very influential on big parts of the left, but also in portions of the political mainstream over the course of the last decade or so. Um, I argue in this book that this is a genuinely novel ideology, that it has changed uh, what uh, it is to be on the left, what the dominant strain of left-wing thinking consists of, 
and that it is having a real influence, uh, not just in terms of some of the stories of cancellation or uh, restrictions of free speech that tend to be widely debated in the media and on uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook, uh, but in terms of the key norms and practices that important social institutions adopt. And this includes both how many of your children might be taught in schools in the DC area. Uh, this includes uh, uh, how many uh, uh, universities and nonprofits conduct themselves, and in includes uh, a lot of important questions of public policy, including such matters as which uh, small businesses and restaurants got relief during the COVID pandemic, or indeed how we distributed life-saving vaccines against COVID in the first months when they were being rolled out but remained sparse. Um, the lead metaphor of a book is to argue that the ideas I'm talking about, the identity synthesis, are a trap. And the fact that they are a trap entails two elements. The first is that a powerful trap will contain some kind of a lure. It will contain something that gives people a reason to fall into it. I think the lure in this case is one that I myself find tempting. It is the recognition that our society in the United States and indeed other democracies around the world remain deeply marked by uh, serious injustices, by forms of discrimination and oppression of uh, racial, sexual, and other minority groups. And it contains of a promise that these ideas will be better able than any alternatives to help us fight against uh, these forms of injustice. That a uh, emphasis on identity groups and on a particular form of social justice is what it takes to rip up all the unjust institutions in our society and finally put us on the path towards greater virtue. I nevertheless argue that these ideas are a trap. They are a trap in the political sense, because as we've seen in the last years, they've actually made it very hard for many institutions to function well in our society. Some of those are facially neutral institutions like universities. Some of them are progressive organizations uh, whose goals I don't always completely share, but many of which do have important goals like providing representation uh, for uh, uh, people accused of serious crimes and uh, nonprofits uh, uh, helping to mount public defense uh, of uh, uh, the accused. And yet many of those institutions have had terrible internal meltdowns in the words of some of their leaders. They are now more preoccupied with fighting each other than with actually serving their mission. It is a trap because of the kind of uh, practices that we've adopted in many educational Context. As I show in the book, uh, many schools around the country have now adopted uh, uh, mandatory affinity groups, effectively mandatory affinity groups, as early as the third grade, the second grade, or the first grade, in which teachers come in and split students up into a black classroom and a Latino classroom and an Asian American classroom and a white classroom. And that, uh, though it might be well-intentioned, will, I think, uh, make it harder to avoid the kind of zero-sum conflict between different ethnic and other identity groups, which is most capable of tearing diverse societies like the United States apart. When you take white kids and tell them to think of themselves as racial beings, to own their racial identity as uh, whites, uh, you might be hoping to create more anti-racist activists but I think you're much more likely to create racists and white supremacists. Um, and then finally, I think it's a political trap because uh, far-right populism and what I call the identity synthesis may superficially look as though they're antonyms, look as though they are as far apart ideologically as they might be. In practical and political terms, they end up reinforcing each other. 
Uh, one of the reasons why it became so hard to critique these ideas on the left uh, after 2016 was that Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. And from that moment onwards, any criticism of bad ideas on the left came to look in many spaces like you were a traitor, like you were secretly running interference for Donald Trump. But on the other hand, one of the reasons why Donald Trump is now running head to head with Joe Biden in polls for 2024 is that a lot of people have been pushed away from the Democratic Party by the influence that these ideas have both of the parts of that political movement and more broadly the mainstream institutions that people associate with the Democrats. According to one recent analysis in the New York Times, about 10% of Republican voters are part of a kind of new political tribe, which is predominantly young, non-white, quite progressive on social issues, but deeply concerned about the hold that quote-unquote woke ideas have over mainstream political institutions. And finally, I think that it's also a personal trap. Uh, I agree that we all have the desire to be seen and affirmed in our individuality in society, that we all seek some form of social recognition. And of course, one of the preconditions for that is that society should not look down on us because of the group we're part of. When there's deep injustices, when people are denigrated on behalf of a group of which they are a part, it is hard for us to gain that social respect and recognition, and that's one of the reasons why we must fight against those forms of injustice. But it is, I think, a mistake to teach people, and teaching a lot of young students who are very thoughtful, who are very open to thinking about the world, I can tell you that this is what they've been taught all of their lives at this point, to teach people that the way to seek that recognition is to define themselves fundamentally by the intersection of identities at which they stand. My brother may share a very, different, a very similar intersection of identities to me, but if he and I are just seen as a function of that intersection of identities, if he and I are seen as identical in the way we are treated and thought of in society, that is not going to allow him and it's not going to allow me to gain that kind of sense of recognition that we actually do seek. Some conservative critiques of identity politics say that... Uh, uh, you know, people want to be unique little snowflakes, and that's a problem. I think we are all unique little snowflakes. My problem with the identity synthesis is that it doesn't allow consideration of the ways in which we're defined by our unique little snowflakeness, by our own individual uh, tastes and idiosyncrasies and preferences and achievements and so on. This is a very, very uh, high-level overview of a, the introduction to the book. <laughs> the book has four parts. In the first part, I do something that remarkably very few people have so far attempted, which is uh, to provide an intellectual history of where these ideas come from. I suggest that it is a mistake to think of this as the few histories that have tried to trace its origins claim as a form of cultural Marxism. Uh, that, I think, is a little bit like saying that you've taken the bat out of baseball. That's not very much left of baseball if you take the bat out of it. In the same way, there's not much left of Marxism if you take economic categories like class out of it. And instead, I root uh, these ideas in the traditions of postmodernism, postcolonialism, and critical race theory, which together, I think, can help to explain the themes of contemporary social justice politics. Secondly, I try to solve a puzzle which is how it is that by 2010, these ideas had become very influential on campus, but remained very marginal to society as a whole. And I tell a political, sociological, technological story of how they were able, from about 2010 to about 2020, to have this unprecedented hold over our mainstream institutions. In the third part of the book, I uh, discuss and evaluate the applications of a popularized version of the identity synthesis to many areas of our political and cultural life. I argue that uh, uh, despite uh, the fact that our experiences might be shaped by where we stand in society, we should not, we must not give up on the ability to understand each other across identity lines and build a form of political solidarity that is rooted in true empathy 
and mutual understanding. I argue that it's a mistake to uh, put under general pole of suspicion the forms of cultural exchange now often called cultural appropriation. That there are much more straightforward ways of expressing injustices when they do occur and that our ability to have cultural exchange is one of the virtues rather than one of the vices of deeply diverse societies like the United States. I make a case for the First Amendment and a case for a broader culture of free speech, arguing that traditional uh, ideas for why free speech matters have not captured its importance. That uh, we tend to talk about the good things that come from free speech, but the strongest arguments are rooted in the bad things that happen when we don't have free speech. I explain why the forms of progressive separatism in our educational system that I alluded to earlier are a mistake, why they are likely to make it harder for us to reduce mutual prejudices, for us to come to know each other in ways that allow us to overcome injustices. And I critique the new focus on equity and on race-sensitive public policies, arguing that more universal uh, welfare state institutions are much more likely to uh, foster economic prosperity and uh, to overcome the legacy of historical economic injustices. Finally, in the fourth part of the book, I boil the tradition of the identity synthesis down to some of its main claims, showing that they were always shaped uh, by a rejection of the liberal tradition. And I argue how uh, philosophical liberals can systematically respond to each of these claims in a way that takes injustice seriously without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, without giving up on what is best and most appealing in the humanist, universalist tradition of the United States. I really look forward to the responses to uh, the book. I'll just say one thing at the end, which is that uh, in a way the book is a vindication of the political tradition that I think has done best in this country and in other democracies around the world and allowing us to make hard won if imperfect progress towards more prosperous and tolerant societies. Um, some of the most influential defenders of uh, gay rights and of same-sex marriage have argued about how the first fight was against a tradition within the gay rights movement that said, we want to abolish marriage because that's a bourgeois institution. Why would we want any part of it? And they had to fight for the more universalist position of saying, no, what we want is equal treatment. What we want is to be admitted as equals into the institution of marriage, not to tear it down. The dominant political tradition uh, among Afri um, African Americans has for most of American history been shaped by people like Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., and others, people who recognized the deep injustices that shaped America in the day, who called out, as Douglas did in his speech commemorating the 4th of July, uh, the hypocrisy of some of his fellow citizens who talked about all men being created equal while uh, African Americans were held in chains. But he didn't say, let's rip up those institutions. He said, let us live up to them. If you mean those ideals seriously, then you have to strive to live up to them. And in that sense, I think, Philosophical liberalism, rightly understood, is a small p progressive creed, is one that wants to preserve the genuine progress we have made, but that also always strives to bring reality into closer alignment with our ideals. What's striking about the identity trap is not just that it's in important respects a genuinely novel ideology, it is also that it has allowed for the first time in American history the far more radical and actually, when you trust opinion polls, far less popular version of identity politics to win over, over its universalist variant. That it has put on a pedestal in our institutions today the kinds of people who would have been on the other side of the most successful champions of gay rights, of the most successful champions of uh, the civil rights movement and uh, abolitionism. Um, that's it. I look forward to uh, the responses. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Yasha.
All right, I'm going to ask our discussants to talk. And Yasha, if you get upset, you can yell at them. I, I think will, I'll I think furiously you're, make notes on my phone. So <laughs> my son, that's, I always say that, too. That's a good... <laughs> oh, you, can, you can play Fortnite while people talk. Uh, you, you want to go first? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. Well, thank you, Stan, for inviting me to be part of the panel and for causing me to read this book right when it came out, before it was sold out. I'm glad to have a copy. And um, thank you, Yasha, for writing the book. I found it... And I, very impressive argument and also a pleasure to read. Um, it's, as you could tell from his presentation, a very dispassionate analysis of a complexity of ideas and emotions, hopes and fears, right, that go into what you're calling the identity synthesis. And it was helpful for someone like me, who is someone who's not particularly compelled by the identity synthesis, I'll just say at the outset, someone who's more prone to see um, the ways that it might be destructive. It was helpful for me to see why many of the steps that went into the creation of this um, doctrine, as it were, were reasonable, right? And that can, that can help me understand why people subscribe to it. But I, I don't think I'm your real audience for your, for your book or your core audience for your book. I think the core audience is probably what I would call a recovering identity synthesis um, addict, you know, someone who was really bought into this and who is coming to see um, don't don't tell it, people the book is sold out and they're not part of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, like I said, you should read it. I found it extremely helpful for me. But I think it's the people you're really trying to get to deeply, right, are those people that have bought into this, that think it will find, will give them a way to understand themselves, their world, give them a place in their world, give them a, a blueprint for meaningful action. And I've started to see that may not be the case. You make the point that this has swept over our country very quickly, really, in the last 10 years. And a lot of people who have grasped onto this idea are now starting to see that maybe this isn't what I thought it was, right? And you tell some stories at the end um, to, to, that, that causes me to think that that's probably your core audience. And because you're trying to address people who may be compelled by this but are now starting to look for an alternative, the last part of your book is very important, right, where you offer the alternative. Um, that you glossed right here at the end. You call it philosophical lib liberalism. Um, so I want to focus on that last part um, while saying that the entire book is very helpful and important, and I recommend you read it. It's thick, but it reads very quickly, actually, because it's very well written. Um, so I want to focus on the last part, which is the defense of liberalism. And I want to focus on what I think might be further developed. Okay, so there are some good things in there, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, just go for those things that I, I think don't miss, uh, don't, don't hit the mark. And I have three things to talk about. One, I don't think it rhetorically hits the mark. I don't think it actually meets people where they are. Two, I don't think it substantively hits the mark. I don't think it actually defends what you want to defend. And three, I don't think it prescriptively hits the mark. I don't think it points well enough toward helping people become the citizens that you want them to become. So first, rhetorically, when you start to lay out what philosophical liberalism is, you go back to the early modern way of laying this out. You literally almost kind of repeat a Lockean or even Habesian story where there's a war of all against all, illiberal worlds are full of violence and hierarchical oppression, unjustified oppression, uh, child sacrifice, you go a little further than Hobbes, I think. So you paint this portrait of a world in which there is just meaningless violence and chaos around you. Um, I have some doubts about just the ability to, for that old rhetorical approach to meet our moment. As you show in the beginning, ideas kind of move forward and, and um, they gain a sort of compelling attraction by, by critiquing the idea that came right before. But I think even more deeply than that, we're not really in that early modern moment. We, in America anyway, are not living in a world in which we're immersed in chaotic violence. Therefore, we're not longing for peace and prosperity above all. In part, it's because of the success of the modern state in bringing that about that we often sort of overlook that that's even a real good that we need to, to seek to preserve. So I think you're right to remind people that we shouldn't take things like peace and prosperity for granted, and perhaps recent events might have woken people up to that, maybe not. But I don't really think it's sufficient to move adherents of the identity synthesis, or really most American citizens. You make a remark somewhere in the book that what people fear most right now is being alone. Right? They fear loneliness, being an isolated individual without a real culture. And 
I don't think that the way that you describe philosophic liberalism actually speaks to that deepest fear. But I think you can address that fear without abandoning what you really care about. So this is my substantive point, my, my sense that what you're substantively defending here as philosophical liberalism doesn't actually describe um, what you mean, what you seem to mean to point to in other ways. So when you're talking about the successes of philosophical liberalism and why we shouldn't throw this baby out with the bathwater, um, you talk about the great gains that modern Western democracies have made in overcoming inequality and oppression, right? And you make reference, for example, to the civil rights movement of 20th century America. Now, that really can't be understood, I think, the civil rights movement, as a sort of manifestation of philosophical liberalism alone anyway, right? You really can't understand the civil rights movement without reference to the specific document that is the Declaration of Independence, without the Constitution. In other words, without a specific history that our country shares, a specific set of commitments that we have. Um, you indicate some impatience with the Constitution in the course of this book. You say, I think we might make better decisions if we ignore the jurisprudence sometimes. But I think that's a mistake, right? Because the law is something that we have agreed upon as a people. And it might be kind of strange in particular, right? But it is, it is something we own in common. You also can't understand the civil rights movement without reference to biblical religions. Um, Many of, the, many of the, the people that were marching in, uh, in those movements were inspired by a commitment to human equality because they understood that to be inscribed in, uh, in the Bible. In other words, we have achieved what we've achieved in part because we are, we are part of a complex culture. You might say it's not just a liberal culture. It's a liberal, we live in a liberal democratic republic that demands that we as citizens take up a share in ruling. We are stamped by a kind of biblical a history of biblical religion, and we also have a kind of desire for enlightenment as manifested in the fact that education is so important to us. So I think if you were to describe what we shouldn't throw out, as it were, and you, and you told a richer and more complex story, that would be a little bit different for each country, I think, um, though it bears some, some similarities across them, that would be a better way to defend what what you're, what you're saying actually brought us all these good results, and would also allow people to uh, have a sense of belonging, feel that they are not alone, right? They're part of a country with a history, a checkered history in some sense, but a history that has actually succeeded in overcoming injustice and oppression for a lot of people. So this brings me to the third point, which is that um, people feel a part of something not only when they see themselves as part of a history, but also when they think that they can contribute to its future, when they can exercise a kind of agency. So how would you develop that as a kind of um, response or alternative to the identity synthesis? And this is where I'm, I'm wondering about the prescription that you have here. I'm not sure that it's most, that it's most effective um, to ask everyone to subscribe to universal values and neutral rules, which you say are core liberal precepts. Um, I don't think that actually helps people develop agency. Rather, to appeal to another kind of liberal tradition, maybe a Tocquevillian liberalism, um, people develop a sense of agency and belonging and a capacity to think that their lives are meaningful when they're given space to act in ways um, that are different than their neighbors sometimes, right? And they have local associations, communities, schools, I think, are very important. Um, and so that, that kind of liberalism, again, is a bit more complex than the liberalism you present here. It, it allows people to have non, to ascribe to non-universal values. You can have Jewish schools and Christian schools and Muslim schools and secular schools and so forth. Um, but it might actually best prepare people to engage in a, uh, in a liberal democratic republic in the end. And I can talk more about why I think that is if, if you want to talk about pedagogy. But I might just note at the end that even Locke didn't think that, uh, that children at a young age should be exposed to universal nationalized schooling. He favored a form of homeschooling, or we might say a kind of private schooling that would allow a child to be raised in a more particular tradition and develop a kind of independence of thought that would suit him to be a liberal democratic citizen.
That's why I have him do these Dutch election events so you can see the 17 different Protestant parties with their own school system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yasha, do you want to respond? Or you, shall you, oh, yeah. yeah. Shall, shall, shall yeah. we respond each time? Or? Yeah, if you want. I'm happy either way. Yeah. Uh, it makes it a little bit yeah. easier for me, so I'm very happy to do that. So thank you. That was a really helpful and thoughtful criticisms. Um, uh, let me start with a question of who I'm trying to reach. Um, I very self-consciously had two audiences in mind in writing this book. And I think you were right about one of them, but you sort of missed the other one, if that makes sense. And so the first one is uh, the people who are genuinely torn about uh, where to fall. Um, and that's, you know, that describes a lot of my friends and colleagues, right? People who, for good reason, are concerned about injustices in America, um, who at first thought that these ideas just want to create a better and more just world, um, but who have over the last few years become quite uneasy. Um, you know, a friend of mine who uh, was always very skeptical when I would talk about my critique of uh, these identitarian notions, uh, and who, after I saw her after a few years again, you know, at the tail end of a pandemic, made a beeline for me straight across a crowded room and said, my God, I now got what you've been talking about because the nonprofit she worked for had just torn itself apart, fired somebody in ridiculous ways and just became incapable of serving its mission. So I do want to reach those people who I think are lured by these ideas but are open to an argument that might make them realize its pitfalls and divorce them from it. And that's an important audience. There is, however, also a second very important audience, and that's that um, you know, the things that have been written on this so far are, with a couple of notable exceptions, uh, by people who are post-liberals, who explicitly think that to fight the liberalism from the left, we have to embrace the liberalism on the right, and who I think mislead us in important ways about the nature of these ideas. If you think this is cultural Marxism, that's not just wrong as a matter of intellectual history, and we can go into that whole debate um, as to why I, I think that is, you also misunderstand these ideas, and then you become incapable of arguing against them effectively. So a second mission that I think is just as core to the project is reaching people who already dislike these ideas and giving them the best arguments, the most effective arguments against these ideas, and in the process, hopefully, showing them that there's a way to argue against these ideas that doesn't require you to give up on the basic values of our American tradition or philosophical liberalism more broadly by embracing uh, uh, you know, these various forms of post-liberal ideology that are, that are, that are, that are fashionable on the right. Um, so uh, it's interesting. I think you focus a lot on sort of the one chapter in which I give a little potted history in defense of liberalism. Um, uh, uh, and I think in abstraction from the rest of the book, that might be a fair criticism, but that way of framing it is sort of uh, uh, perhaps rhetorically doesn't hit the mark. The, the point I'm trying to make there is that people often like to say today that liberalism is somehow a naive ideology, that it's an ideology that doesn't reckon with fundamental conflict, that isn't capable of dealing with a deeply politically polarized moment. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I focus in that context on the history of the early modern period and so on for a couple of pages is that uh, that's just a complete misunderstanding of what gives liberalism its force, right? It was forged in response to deep religious conflict, to deep intergroup conflict. And I think understanding that can hopefully help people see why it remains relevant now. Why saying, hey, but the stakes are high today, how can we care about these abstract principles, is precisely to get wrong what the force of those principles has been in allowing us to make peace. Um, but, but substantively, I think that rhetorically, the key point is a different one. When you go back to the critical race theorists, they claim that, uh, according to Derek Bell, for example, why they acknowledge as one of the founders of a tradition, America in 2000 was as racist as it was in 1950 or 1850. Something that I think is offensive, not to the great Americans living today in this room, but to the many people who experienced much worse forms of racial subordination in the American past. Um, and if you buy that premise, then I can see how you might say, let's rip the whole thing up, right? If America is as racist today as it was in 1850, even for 450 years, we've tried to live up to our universal values. And we haven't made any progress. Well, then perhaps we should rip up the Declaration of Independence and 
make how we all treat each other and how the state treats all of us more explicitly depend on the identity groups of which we're a part. I think that that is untrue. I think that's an absurd reading of the American present or of American history. Um, and, and if you do think that we've made progress, then the idea of saying let's continue to make progress, let's continue to live up to these ideals is much more appealing. And to me, that's actually sort of a key rhetorical argument that is, that is at stake um, rather than the, 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 the early modern one. Um, On the substantive point, uh, I don't think we have to choose between whether the civil rights movement was an American uh, tradition and conversation with the Constitution or whether it was liberal. Because in my interpretation, the American Constitution is, among other things, a liberal document. And so I don't see the tension between these two things. Um, of course, the civil rights movement, like any political movement, is a particular movement, a particular nation that owes a lot to its particular history and culture. That, uh, that culture, in this case, is deeply liberal. And so I, 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 I don't see why those two things sort of come apart in the way that you uh, seem to suggest. Um, and just to say, I don't think I'm impatient with a constitution. I'm very impatient with a lot of political scientists who have been writing books recently saying we should get rid of a constitution. Um, what, the specific point I make uh, is, I think, one that people who care about the constitution um, should get on board with which is that we have started to uh, reduce many deeper moral debates to, in, in, to, to, to interpretive debates over particular phrases in the Constitution, in part because I think the Supreme Court has started to encroach in far too many areas of American life. And so I don't think, uh, the, the point I make is that I don't think that debating the death penalty um, in a helpful way should be passed through whether or not it constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. I think that just reduces the moral stakes of a debate in an unhelpful way. You can't make the best arguments for the death penalty or the best arguments against the death penalty by trying to have this interpretive debate. And the solution to that is not to give up on the Constitution, uh, but it is to narrow the scope of the kinds of things the Supreme Court can uh, decide about, in part because it is then able to stand up for the key provisions in the Constitution when those come under pressure from uh, illiberal political movements. Um, and so finally, about sort of whether the book hits the mark prescriptively and what we should appeal to, um, I'm open to a Tocquevillian liberalism. I don't think that the nature of my liberalism is in conflict with that. I develop my thoughts on, uh, you know, this book is a response to the attacks on liberalism. I have much more to say about my substantive view of what an American liberalism would look like in my previous work, including The Great Experiment. Um, and there I argue precisely against an individualist liberalism that sets it up in conflict with religion, in conflict with different communities. I think the people, uh, smart people like Alistair McIntyre, who reject liberalism uh, because it is incapable of honoring the kinds of ties that we have to particular communities are, are, are wrong because they take one errant tradition of liberalism to be representative of the entire tradition. And here going back to the 18th century once more is actually helpful because what is liberalism at its core? It is to say how can we have a society with people with very different beliefs, very different convictions, very different religious practices and have them live productively and peacefully uh, as compatriots. And a big part of the answer is that we need to give them individual freedoms, like the freedom to assembly and the freedom of worship, because those are mandated by how important those communities are to people. So I don't think that my vision of liberalism is uh, in conflict with a Tocquevillian notion of it, for I can see how perhaps uh, I could have made that more clear at, at, at certain points in the book. Thank you, Aisha. Um, I'll follow up on that the last thing you said there. Let's go to uh, Christine first, before we Sure. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is thank you for coming into the lion's den to defend your work. <laughs> it's always welcome, our liberal friends. Um, we have many refugees here, actually, from liberalism, the kind of liberalism that you describe in your book. Um, but one of my favorite parts of the book is your complete uh, denunciation of the phrase I probably dislike more than any other in 
current discourse, my truth. Hi. It's a wonderful <laughs> takedown, but I will reveal a little of my truth, which is that as a graduate student, I was force-fed Foucault, and having to revisit Foucault was a very traumatic experience for me <laughs> reading your book, but you did it very well. I mean, I, I never gained any more sympathy for him or any of his ideas, but you, I, I do recommend to people who don't know some of the philosophical traditions upon which a lot of this, you know, the woke stuff is built, to, to read those chapters, they're very illuminating. Um, so I just want to throw out three things that bugged me um, and see if uh, you have a response. This is how I approach books uh, with very powerful <laughs> arguments. I'm like, that annoyed me. And then I go back and read it. I'm like, I'm still annoyed. So I'm going to bring those up. Uh, the first was this sentence. Most of the people who embrace, uh, embrace it, meaning this you know, sort of uh, identity politics, most of the people who embrace it genuinely aspire to make the world a better place. This is a very generous statement. I also think it's wrong. Um, because the word that kept, I kept writing in the margins and I kept thinking about while reading the book is power. Because I think a lot of this uh, philosophy, although some do generally want to improve uh, the world, uh, a lot of this really is about power. I think that's explicit on campus where you have a younger generation um, appealing no longer to uh, using vague ideas um, in order to achieve power in, in the only way they can, which is to run to an administrator and say, I feel unsafe. So that is that the, uh, the adults in the room problem, which I think you sketch out very well when you talk about corporations, you talk about academia, you're like, where are the adults in the room? Why, why are they uh, allowing this to happen? Well, it's a power struggle. And if you think, particularly in the corporate space, there's still a lot of, you know, in academia, you've got tenured boomers. In corporate space, you've got people who, for better or worse, are kind of tenured boomers. Even in rising younger generation that wants those jobs, that wants that power, and I know this sounds very Manichaean, but there are different ways to achieve power. One of the ways to do that is something that I think, um, and this speaks to my second point, um, how the younger generation understands power. And to that end, I think a lot of what you wrote about social media was very uh, incisive and excellent, how social media platforms have become a way not only to meet lots of other people who share very extreme ideas about identity with you and then feel like you have a tribe that you belong to and gives you a sense of purpose, a kind of secular faith, as John McWhorter has argued, um, but it also allows you to exercise power. Because if you have a bunch of junior staffers at the New York Times who decide they feel unsafe, they can get people fired and did get people fired. So the power dynamic here is, I think, something I would have liked to hear a lot more of your thoughts about, especially since, as you described very, very well, the old mediating institutions that used to kind of uh, do the checks and balances in corporations, academia, and elsewhere um, have broken down. Um, so that, uh, and that brings up again with the, with the young folks, uh, the free speech issue. So I loved your evisceration of the current version of the ACLU. Again, well worth reading, uh, very succinct to the point. Um, uh, an organization that very tragically has lost its way and no longer is pursuing its original mission. Um, but again, I think if you look at the younger generation and you look at how they understand speech, they talk about speech as actively harmful. As, and there's a really, uh, the through line of risk aversion in the younger generation really strikes me when I hear them talk about speech, particularly on campus. Um, and again, the role of social media here is very powerful. They can use these platforms to shun and to call out uh, wrong think and to say this person is racist, sexist, oppressive, colonialist, whatever, whatever they want to say. Um, any response to that is not allowed if it, if it leads to an argument that someone feels unsafe. So um, I agree that we shouldn't use the word snowflakes on the right. I'm sick of that term. Um, but I do think that there is something about risk aversion in the rising generation that l gives them this uh, understanding of speech as something that can be a tool to pursue power, but also um, a manipulable thing rather than a principle. And that concerns me deeply. And the example I will give of that, and you, you also make an example of her in this book, is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, someone who has extremely restrictive, almost authoritarian views of free speech, which she proudly gives to her, not to her constituents, who she doesn't spend much time with, but to her followers, of whom she's got you know, gazillions on Instagram. She isn't really a politician. She's an influencer politician, which is a new breed, unfortunate breed, that we are going to see more and more of. Um, and that obviously, as you've always written about in, the, in, in his work, see, see their role not as, uh, not, not as part of an institution, but as giving them a platform to, to pursue their own ends. Um, so the free speech, the, the 
young people's version of uh, understanding of free speech as a form of risk aversion and safety was the other thing that was on my mind. And finally, um, you do talk about, uh, I liked your discussion of a kind of healthy form of patriotism as an alternative to identity politics, a way in which nations can, can uh, encourage and inculcate in their citizens values and virtues that help them see, uh, see each other as kind of all in this together. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's possible until we have a restorative project when it comes to the history we teach in this country. And there has been, and this long predates a lot of these uh, you know, sort of woke discussions that have gone on. This has been going on for a very long time. Um, uh, fights over history standards, fights over who gets to tell the story. The standpoint theory discussion that you have in the book, you know, who, who gets to tell the story? Do you have to be of the group that is describing the oppression or can you be outside of it? So I'm trained as a historian. I, I would not be allowed to write anything because I am not, you know, I'm not a dead white male who I studied eugenics movement, who studied eugenics. So I'm not allowed to put myself in the shoes of those people. But that's what history is. And I think I would point to the 1619 Project as a perfect example of why it will be a very challenging thing to, for the, again, for younger generations to learn what a healthy patriotism looks like, to learn what healthy debate and discussion looks like. Um, my kids go to DC public schools, they're seniors now, and the kind of stories that they heard in history classes did not allow for discussion of any of those ideas that didn't conform to a curriculum that, again, to, your, to, your, to the remark that bugged me at the beginning, certainly drafted by people who had the best intentions, but who also were profoundly influenced by an ideological mission about making sure we all understand how terrible our country has been. And I think trying to restore some balance there is going to be a challenge when the mainstreaming of things like 1619 Project and other ideological historical projects um, are so prevalent. So those are three things that bugged me. <laughs> Sounds like some of the Foucault's talk from your first and oh, second see, point. I know, I'm getting it. <laughs> I'm very sorry to have re-traumatized yes, you by see, exposing you I to... Need a safe I sort of given you a trigger warning, but um, uh, these are great points, and I'm going to copy uh, your approach to this for all future uh, occasions in which I might be asked to do something similar and say, great book, you have a free things that bug me. I love it. Um, so on those three things... Um, I don't know that uh, good intentions and a craving for power need to be mutually exclusive. Um, so I tend to see the world in such a way that most people are the heroes in their own story, in their own movie. There are exceptions to that, right? There's a very few sociopathic people who say, I'm out to just maximize my own self-interest and don't care about anything else and who even take pride in saying, I'm cynically acting in some way or adopting certain views that are harmful to the world, but I'm going to get ahead. Um, and there is evidence that on the political extremes, including the far right, but also very much the far left, mm -hmm. uh, people with what psychologists call dark personality triad, mm -hmm. uh, so Machiavellianism, narcissism, and so on, uh, are overrepresented. So there certainly are some people of whom that's going to be true. And yet I do think that most people who embrace these ideas, as most people embrace other kinds of extremist ideas, are genuinely persuaded that they're trying to make the world a better place. And that in order to make the world a better place, they need to win power. And so uh, this justifies all of the sometimes very cynical actions and very cruel actions that they engage in. Um, so I guess I would say that um, it is about power, um, but that doesn't mean that the people who are seeking power aren't genuinely convinced of the righteousness of their ideas. And that's not specific to this tradition. That's a sort of broader way that I see the world, perhaps naively. I, I do, I mean, I, I try not to be too cynical about the world. I have recently adopted a new rule of thumb of American politics, which is that everybody eventually lives up to the worst caricature of them. Um, so, you know, perhaps I should give up this piece of optimism as well. But... Um, the power dynamics in free speech, um, well, certainly I have been uh, you know, shocked this week by how people who've been claiming for 10 years that silence is violence uh, can somehow come to the conclusion that violence is to be celebrated. Um, uh, and, and, and that's really uh, uh, you know, been, I think, proof of concept of why these ideas must be taken seriously. Um, you know, I was positively surprised by my ability over the last weeks to get on many 
television, radio shows, podcasts, but I'm more left-leaning. I wasn't sure about that when I set out to write this book. But the question I get on every one of those shows is why write about this stuff when the threat from the right is so much bigger? And I think I'm going to ha- get that question less in the coming weeks mm-hmm. because the uh, you know, abject mm-hmm. failure of uh, uh, big parts of the left and of many mainstream institutions, including some that I have affiliations with, to uh, proactively condemn you know, the, the worst slaughter of Jewish civilians since the Holocaust um, is owed to many of these ideas and is a sign of just how, how strong uh, they are. So, so I certainly agree with um, y- your points about that. I think in terms of a power dynamic, um, the striking thing about this past decade is that, uh, you know, uh, what in, in the Hidden Tribe study more in common calls progressive activists are uh, about 8% of the population. Uh, but they're able to have such an outsized influence over our mainstream inf- institutions. And this is, as uh, people like Timur Kura and the Duke would argue, the outcome of a cascade effect in which uh, the prevailing norm uh, uh, is enforced through power, and people who speak out against it uh, become uh, you know, marginalized or sometimes fired in ways that allow ideas that don't actually have majority support to have this kind of uh, discursive hegemony to talk in the language of these ideas. Um, Now, I think part of the project of his book is to push back against that hegemony and to allow us to have a cascade effect in the other directions where all of the people who've been biting their damn lip for 10 years, who haven't actually been talking as they think, are going to raise their voices. And I think when they do, we're going to be able to win back some of those institutions as we need to. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic, for not very optimistic, that uh, you know, the moral failure of the last 10 days will help that come about. But people are going to start to push back much more loudly and much more proudly because of uh, 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 you know, the, the failure of so many institutions to understand what has happened and the way that revealed uh, the favoritism mm-hmm. uh, 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 that is at play there. Um, finally, uh, patriotism and history. Um, yes, I've, I've, I've talked, and I think this is sort of a little bit uh, a response to what you were saying as well. I, I, I had chapters about patriotism in my last two books, and I thought I can't write another damn chapter about patriotism in this book. Um, this crowd loves patriotism, by the way. Compared, like, as, as do I. <laughs> and, and I've changed my mind about patriotism in some ways over time. I, I used to you know, I think there's sort of three, I, I thought there's two conceptions of patriotism, now I think there's three. Um, and obviously I, I rejected ethnic nationalism and I continue to reject ethnic nationalism. I used to embrace civic patriotism and I continue to embrace civic patriotism, but I actually think that there's this third conception as well that is very important and that's one that's rooted in everyday culture. But a lot of what makes people proud is not the founding documents and so on because most people don't come out to hear a political talk on a Monday afternoon with lovely weather. Um, uh, uh, but, but what we love is the cities and the countryside and the sounds and sights and smells of a country and the variety of its cultures and the people you grow up with. And that's what patriotism actually means for people. And that's an attachment to a grown set of uh, uh, communities in your own country. And I think we need to have both a civic patriotism and an everyday cultural patriotism in that kind of way. And that must be built on a view of your country that, that can be realistic, but can acknowledge fully the uh, uh, flaws of our past, but that also must be proud of our accomplishments, that also must be capable of seeing many of the wonderful things in this country that make the United States and other liberal democracies around the world, the countries that immigrants around the world say they would most want to go to, right? Um, and so I agree with you that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a German Jew, uh, and so I used to joke that you know, nationalism does not come naturally to me. Um, and I'm glad that Germany has reckoned in a serious way with the Holocaust, and that is part of how Germans think of themselves. But nobody in Germany ever said, I'm not sure, I can't think of somebody who said, the Holocaust is the definition of Germany. All that Germany boils down to is the Holocaust. That's the only thing, that would be a crazy view to take, even though obviously you can't understand Germany without reckoning with the Holocaust. In the same way, to say that 1619 is one of the founding moments of America in a certain kind of way, but obviously you can't, 
uh, overlook the history of slavery in conceiving of this country makes a lot of sense, but to say that 1619 is the definition of America is unserious, is, is crazy for the same reasons. And so I was very heartened that on the day of, on the day this book was released, um, uh, I, I had both Brett Weinstein, um, who sort of started off as a liberal-ish critic of these ideas and has now gone off far into the conspiratorial right, uh, and Michael Hannah-Jones, uh, the founder of the 1619 Project, shouting at me at the, at the same day on Twitter. So I thought, you know, <laughs> by your enemies shall you know them. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Yasha. You both. You uh, thanks very much, Stan, and thank you for getting us together around this book. Uh, thank you, Yasha, for writing it. I, um, I, I think I was part of the discussion here of your last book, and uh, in a lot of ways, this book... It was online, so it feels different. It, it sure does, <laughs> yeah. yes. I was, I was in my basement for that one. <laughs> um, a, a lot of what's here brought up for me a, a couple of, uh, of the great strengths of that book that I thought might have been more present here, and in a way that's already come up in the conversation. This is a wonderful book, and it, it, it has a lot of Yasha's characteristic strengths. It's very insightful. It's generous. It treats its opponents fairly, sometimes more than fairly. It takes their very best arguments to be their essence, which I think is a good way to argue with people, even if it's not always quite right. Um, and I largely agree with the general case, but I found it to be a very provocative book because it, it crystallized for me the place of the, of the hunger for solidarity in the moment that we're living through. Hmm. And I think the book understates that hunger and therefore the centrality of a desire to belong, a desire that doesn't point to universalism but to particularism in a lot of the problems we see on both the left and the right. Um, the, the book begins in the post-World War II era, which I think is right. We are living now in a kind of reaction against the post-World War II era in some very important respects. And I think that's a, that's a good way to think about a lot of w w what's distinct about this moment. But one of the things that stood out about the post-World War II moment was that it was a time of consolidation and conformity, certainly in American life, when in the wake of mobilization for war and depression, there was just this period where every voice in American life seemed to tell everybody to be more like everybody else. And there was a real powerful mainstream culture in that moment. And in a lot of ways, the, 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 the desires of that moment expressed themselves as a desire to participate in that mainstream. Even liberation movements in that period demanded to be allowed into the mainstream. Certainly that was the case with the civil rights movement. And what they were demanding to be let into is a kind of universalism. There's this very powerful image seared into the national memory from Selma in 1959 of all these black men standing with signs saying, I am a man. Okay. It's an extraordinary thing. But that is a very generic and universal way to describe what you are. Um, and there was, even then, I think, a kind of reaction against the downside of that kind of mainstreamism and universalism, a reaction that's, that felt that moment of the late 50s, early 60s as conformist, as overly oppressive, on the left and the right. And the culture of that moment demanded liberation from conformity. And then we got liberation from conformity, good and hard, for a long time. We went through decades where, in the second half of the 20th century, every voice in American life was saying, not be more like everybody else, but be yourself. And I think we live now in a moment, and, and I should say, that liberation brought tremendous benefits. That liberalization, cultural and economic and political, uh, did a lot of good. But we live now in a moment that is very awake to the costs of that liberation from conformity. And a moment that feels itself to be oppressed by individualism. And over and over, when you spoke about universalism in the book, I, I, I wrote in the margin, universalism is individualism. It is perceived now by its critics, but also by a lot of other people as a kind of radical individualism. And in some ways, it is a radical individualism. Universalism says that what's distinct about us is what's distinct about individuals. And it denies us a kind of distinction that is groupish. Um, I think we live in a time now when people yearn for solidarity. We're not very good at articulating that. 
But there is a kind of unarticulated hunger for solidarity at the heart of a lot of what is going on in our politics. Um, I think it points to some people, for some people toward identitarianism, toward group identity. It points for some people toward nationalism. Um, but it is a, a hunger, a desire to belong, to affiliate, not just to be one individual out there in the world, but to, to, to reach for solidarity. And today's liberation movements want liberation from universal individualism. They want, uh, they want particularism. And they, the, the, the resurgence of particularism or of a desire for it is mediated by our politics in a very polarized time, which means there's really different left-right versions of it. But I think there is a kind of common hunger at the bottom of those. Um, and so let me say just a word about left-right in this context. Very crudely, and I, I wrote a book about this once, which I, I would recommend to you, I think. But um, <laughs> broadly speaking, and maybe to borrow a couple of terms from Arnold Kling, too, is very good on these questions. We can think about right and left. We can think about the left as thinking about politics in terms of oppressor and oppressed. And the right is thinking about politics in terms of civilization and barbarism, order and chaos. Broadly speaking, I think reaching back even to the 18th century, the left and right are distinct in these ways. And we have today forms of identitarianism, looking for solidarity, for group membership, one of which thinks in terms of oppressor and oppressed. And it is, by the way, related to Marxism in this very limited way. I, I think your criticism of, it is, of its being called Marxism is absolutely right. But Marxism was a kind of oppressor oppressed ideology too. Uh, and, and that's the view you're arguing with, the, the kind of identitarianism of oppressor and oppressed. There's also an identitarianism of civilization and barbarism, of order and chaos. They confront each other in some of our deepest debates, and they just talk past each other. When we talk about immigration, when we talk about crime, one group of people is talking about oppressor and oppressed. The other is talking about order and chaos. They think they're arguing with each other, and they have no idea what each other is really saying. But I think that they're both reaching for a kind of, of identitarianism that is a response to what feels like the oppressive uh, universalism of this moment. But there's one, other, there's one other axis of politics here beyond left and right. It's related, but it's not the same, which I would describe, I think, and your book really clarified this for me, not quite as left and right, but as insider and outsider. Who feels like this is my society, and I own it, and these damn people are, are barging into it, and who feels like I'm on the outside, banging on the window, and I can't get in? I think that in my lifetime, and in the period that you describe, in the course of the second half of the 20th century, and the beginning of this one, we've seen a reversal between left and right when it comes to who's the insider and who's the outsider. The right used to think of itself as the insider, owning the institutions, standing up for their standards. Um, and the left is, is barbarians at the gate, invading the institutions. The left used to think of itself as the outsider, fighting the man, fighting the power. And today, though they, neither of them quite admits it, they've, they've just switched sides. And the right is the outsider, the left is the insider. I, 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 I'll give you a very quick example, not to take too much time. When the inside party loses a close election, it says the Russians interfered. That's something the right would have said for most of my lifetime. It's not absolutely something the left would say. When the outside party loses a close election, it says the elites who run the government and the elites who run the corporations colluded mm. to take this from the voice of the people. That's something the left would have said for most of my lifetime. It's now what the right says. Th that's a profound transformation that we should be much more alert to and are thinking about our politics now. And I think it has a lot to do with the subject you're taking up. Because what we have now is an outsiderist right and an insiderist left. And those are both very dangerous versions of the right and the left. An outsider right is hostile to the institutions, which leaves the institutions with no natural defender. And an insider is left has no sense of responsibility. It still thinks of itself as arguing for the oppressed, even though it is the elite. And that means that it, it, it is authoritarian. It just inclines to authoritarianism very quickly and uses power without thinking seriously about power. I think seeing these elements, seeing the ways in which a certain kind of um, desire for solidarity and identity contributes to the story you're telling, 
would deepen that story quite a bit. And it would help in the end, and I'll close here, in a couple of ways at the end of the book when you talk about what could be done. Um, I think, first of all, that for me at least, seeing that angle, and this is a supplement and not a substitute for the very important argument that you're making, I think seeing things from that angle would, it tends to minimize for me the role of technology in all this. I, I think social media is just a tool. And the question to ask ourselves is why are we using this tool in this way? That's a question about what we want, not so much about the technology. And I, I guess I've become less and less impressed with the significance of the, of the character of social media because in a different moment, America would have used it in a very different way. And it's that moment that needs to be explained. Um, secondly, I would say that seeing this angle can help us think a little bit about free speech, too, and the nature of the debate between right and left right now. One of the ways that the, the insider and outsider have switched is that the right is now the power of free speech, right? The party of free speech was the left. The free speech movement was a left-wing movement. They haven't simply switched sides. The, 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 right's, the right's defense of free speech and the left's defense of it need to be thought about, I think, in very different ways. The case for free speech now is a case that answers people who worry that free speech is being used to oppress people. Whereas 60 years ago, the defense of free speech needed to speak to people who were worried that free speech is letting barbarians in, is letting people who have no respect for our society intrude, invade, take over our institutions. Now the case for free speech says it has to speak to people who are worried that we're allowing oppressive, evil people to have power. Those are different problems, even though they're both about free speech. And I think the defense of free speech that you make is more like the defense that was made in the 1970s and doesn't speak enough to the particular kind of worry that today's enemies of free speech have. I think they're wrong, but th th as you say, they're wrong for reasons that are, are understandable, are accessible. And we should think about what they're saying in, in trying to answer them. And finally, I would just say more generally that the desire for solidarity has to be recognized and met and taken seriously in making the case for liberalism. Liberalism is not, in fact, radical individualism. There is a very strong case to make for, for the liberal political tradition to people who care a lot about solidarity and community affinity I think it's, a, I think it's the, the most important case to be making for liberalism now. Um, and it's a case that can be made with the help of conservative liberals, of Edmund Burke, of, of Tocqueville. Um, there are many others. I mean, I think properly read, the, 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 the Constitution looks like this. It's a kind of communitarian liberal document. The Declaration of Independence is too. Any document that starts, we the people, or that says, we hold these truths, is a document that speaks for a community and can be understood and, and expressed and defended that way. And I guess I would just use the term universalist a little less in talking about liberalism because what you're defending is better than that. It's deeper than that. And there's a sensitivity in this moment to the idea that liberalism is radical individualism. And my sense is that there's more to be said for it than that. Bail in there. Thank you, that was, that was great and, and very fruitful and very deep. I think sort of passing what of that is a compliment to the book and what of that is a critique of a book, and I'll keep chewing on that. But let me just make a few observations in how uh, part of that is expressed in the book and part of it perhaps uh, is a compliment to it. Um, so the first point is I, I agree with you. Uh, and it didn't quite feel to me like a central part of this story, for I can see how you might disagree about that, that one of the trans fundamental transformations in the United States, but in Western Europe as well, is this strange swap of roles between the left and the right. And it plays out in so many different ways. I mean, you know, in college, I thought that I wanted to be a theater director. And I had grown up in Germany, where the theatrical tradition is, has become very experimental over the last 50 years. And I used to go to these plays that I didn't entirely understand, but I thought there must be really interesting thought behind it, and I really admired those directors. And then I got to work with some of those directors after college. I went back to Germany and worked as an assistant director in one of the great theaters there. And I realized that they were 
completely servants of their tradition, which they didn't understand, mm -hmm. that there wasn't much thought behind it, simply to be experimental and to break the rules had become the convention. And it was actually incredibly unthinking and therefore really boring. And that's why I ran away from the theater. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think a lot of our art is stuck in that trap that you know what it is to be an artist is to break the rules, but they've been breaking rules for a hundred years, <laughs> and so there's not many rules left to break, and it's boring, right? Um, and that's just one kind of little way in which that role reversal you're talking about is really important. One other way is that I've been asked by a few times in the last weeks, and I think it's a smart question. You know, look, the student revolts of the '60s made some real improvements. And don't you think that these ideas will end up making the world a better place as well? I think one of the reasons why I'm not all that optimistic about that is that the student revolt had people on the other side of it, right? When, when I interviewed Danny Cohn-Bendit once, Daniel Rouge, the um, uh, leader of the student movement in Paris in 1968, and he said, thank God we won on culture and thank God we lost on politics. Um, because you know, students uh, at my own school in Munich had walked down uh, the Central Street in Munich decades before I was born, um, shouting, ho, 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 Chimin, Che Guevara, Lenin. So thankfully, they lost in that. And they lost in that in part because they were up against an establishment that knew it was the establishment. But thought in your terms, which I think is very helpful and provocative, that we are on the side of civilization rather than barbarism, so we're going to stand up to these students. And that allowed for a productive clash where some of the more convincing ideas of the students ended up winning over, liberalizing sexual norms and allowing a society that... Uh, permits for people to be more individual in the ways you outline. But lots of the bad ideas ended up going out of a window. Well, a lot of the problem of the last 10 years is that every university present in the country today, I'm slightly overstating, but probably not by much, when they think back to the 60s, they think of themselves as the students, not as the university president, right? And so when students come to them today and say, you know, throw away all the institutional norms and get on board with what we want to do, it's very hard for them to stand up to that because they see themselves in those students rather than in the uh, generations that sort of upheld the institutional norms, sometimes for good and sometimes for ill, right? Um, so, so I think that's right, too. I am very aware that in the case of free speech, um, and there I do think that I make that response explicitly. Um, you know, the left is incoherent at the moment in America, because on the one hand it says that America is fundamentally, not just deeply, but fundamentally, in its essence, racist and white supremacist country. And at the same time, they're calling for more restrictions on free speech, right? And you think, well, who's going to be making those decisions about what speech is allowed and what speech is not allowed? If you think that this country is so racist, then how do you trust that people will be making these decisions to be on your side? And of course, the answer to that is that they secretly, without admitting to it, think that they are in charge. And indeed, that they were in charge in the kinds of institutions like university colleges, where speech codes were first enforced. I mean, we didn't think very hard about what happens when you Which take Which in fairness are not majoritarian institutions, typically, right? Right, right. No, of course. But then we haven't thought very hard about what happens when you export that to the level of a state university or export that to the level of Twitter or export that to the level of the federal government, yeah. right? Obviously, um, all of these debates only care about 10 universities. So. No, that's true. <laughs> but, but there, I think my argument explicitly in return is if you reconceive of free speech as a bad thing that's happened, but that happen when you don't have it, then one of the problems is that it's going to often uh, uh, silence the marginalized and the weak, because by definition, the people who are taking decisions are the powerful. Mm -hmm. And so if you care about that, then you should care about free speech. That's, I think, an argument that expresses this particular free speech moment rather than the older one. Um, more broadly, you know, I think what I am taking away from this conversation is that the word universalism is just not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I've heard this in various things, ways, I think, from each of you, actually. Um, and that may be right. Um, uh, it is, I think, the right response to the deeply particularist norms and customs that have now taken place on the left. And there, I think, we do need a defense of universalism. But that universalism, to me, can be one that is uh, also emphasizing certain forms of patriotism, also emphasizing certain other forms of collective belonging, right? It is uh, not a universalism that says uh, we need to get rid of communities, so we need to get rid of the kinds of ways in which people feel that they belong in a particular tradition. But it is the kind of universalism that says 
we as human beings across those groups can be in communication with each other. We can understand each other. We can have forms of political solidarity that are rooted perhaps in part in our own groups, but that go beyond that as well. We are able to see ourselves uh, as Americans above and beyond the particular groups into which we're born, which doesn't mean that we can't also be Christians and Muslims and Jews, which doesn't mean that we can't celebrate the national cultures from which we originate, um, but that is compatible with a kind of uh, 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 broader belonging that is so often disclaimed in these progressive institutions today. I think on this, you will, uh, you will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure that we have, uh, bearing in mind our conversation last time, I'm not sure we have a fundamental disagreement about that, so perhaps we have more of a disagreement about sort of how I frame and describe that in the book. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. I think as, as Jenna pointed out too, right, there's tension between your, your focus on universalism, but then, you know, at the same time, of all the kinds of identity politics that exist, you're, you seem reasonably comfortable with religious or national or, or, you know, identities determining important chunks of public policy, right? You're not a, a board, nation state shouldn't exist kind of person, no, right? Which is, and, I'm know, not, what, and I'm not in subnational groups shouldn't matter either, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, that's why I, I try to avoid the term identity politics for editors keep putting them in headlines. Um, yeah. uh, I think, you know, MLK and, uh, 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 and, and Frederick Douglass were engaged in identity politics. I think uh, our friends Jonathan Rauch and Andrew Sullivan were engaged in identity politics when they wrote about the case for same-sex marriage. But I think it was an identity politics that was calling for inclusion in universal institutions, right? for recognition as well and for respect and all of those things. But the form that that inclusion and respect should take is fair treatment and inclusion in universal institutions. I think perhaps I've come back to using the term universalism in a way that I haven't done in my previous work because the essence of the ideology I'm attacking is to say, no, uh, the way to understand each other here on stage is fundamentally mediated by identity groups in such a way that if you're in a, a more oppressed intersection, I can't understand you. But and this, is why, way this to, is why you get the term civil rights, right? Because it's not a universal, right? It's, it's a within the nation state. It's, it's a contained uh, sense of equality of right. It's not, it doesn't extend to, to people outside the community in that way. Sure. That's right. And you can take it to a further. Certain duties that extend outside yeah. the community. And of course, and course and you, you can't just use liberalism either because that has right. a, the connotations of the 19th century where, where regionalisms and communities were, um, right. certainly in, in Western Europe, you know, uh, suppressed and, and eliminated. But, but, but let me perhaps make it more concrete for a moment, but I know we, we want to probably get to own questions or your questions. Yeah, we're a little over time already, so I, I think we should we should probably do that. I, if, if you all have another 10 minutes, we can we have permission from our AV friends. Uh, so let's take a few audience questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, good. Let's, uh, we'll probably have time for three, if you limit yourself uh, to a reasonable length. I'll be brief. Questions. <laughs> let's go uh, over there. All these microaggressions. <laughs> yes, that's right. Please wait for the mic and then introduce yourself and then ask a question. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christian Patel. I'm a law student at William & Mary. And my question is about the application of some of these ideas in public education policy. As we saw recently under the de Blasio administration in New York City, some of the ideas you mentioned have been, in my view, misapplied and used with regards to equity to, in their view, help students of color who belong to groups that are historically disadvantaged at the expense, however, of Asian American students. And a lot of this is through disregarding of test scores and changes to the policy around admission to different public schools that hurts Asian Americans while claiming to help with racial equity. What do you think went wrong there? And what do you think would be a better approach to public education policy when it comes to these types of issues? Yeah, so uh, I'm not proud of that many things in my life. I am proud, but as a graduate student at Harvard, I wrote an article in the New York Times uh, saying that Harvard discriminated against Asian Americans. Uh, this was a good 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's just striking to what extent that is, has been happening at our institutions, probably continues to happen. Um, you know, as I understand the data, um, Asian applicants, Asian American applicants to Harvard um, have 
the same extracurricular scores, so they're as likely to have been presidents of various student associations or athletes and so on. Uh, they get the same marks at alumni interviews. So people who actually meet them, and I think alumni interviews are a bad idea for all kinds of reasons. You could see how they might be biased. But even so, they get the same marks as non-Asian applicants. And then the admissions committee at Harvard that's never met these kids, but only has access to those activity scores and those alumni reports, somehow decides that their personality is standards of deviations worse than the personality of anybody else applying to Harvard. I, I think it's hard to think of how that might not be racism. Um, I'm well, not, in the lawsuit, Harvard argued that once you control for the personality score, there's no, there's no disparity. Yeah, if you, if you buy the premise that Asian Americans just all have shitty personalities, then the rest of what Harvard <laughs> did was perfectly they were fine. Literally making that argument. Yeah, no, no, I mean, David Carr, crazy. president of the American Economic Association. Uh, <laughs> um, lovely. Um, I'm not, as you've learned today, a burn the system down kind of a guy. When it comes to the American admission system, I'm a burn the system down kind of a guy. I think it's absurd that I would. But my kids would get preference for admission to most American universities if I were a faculty member there. It's absurd that they'd get you know, preference for admission uh, based on the fact that the parents went to certain schools. Uh, I think it's absurd that uh, athletes get uh, preference for admission. I think it's absurd that the second violinist to the university orchestra uh, gets a boost. I think it's absurd that men get a boost right now because uh, women outperform them and universities are really scared of not having a 50-50 gender ratio because, God forbid, they you know, aren't exactly evenly matched numbers so they can all date each other. I just think the whole thing is, is, is absurd. And part of that is the particular way in which race has played out in the, in the admission system and uh, in which the new ruling will likely incentivize students even more to self-exoticize and to emphasize whether it's true or not that the identity is deeply defined by the particular group that they're from and, uh, and that explains everything about them. Um, uh, uh, that's one of the really pernicious parts, I think, of the system. So, so I, would, I would just start from scratch. Let's go all the way to the back. Hi, I'm Jack Rowing. I'm a research associate here. Um, so earlier you mentioned how you thought that the current identity trap and the obsession of identity has harmed certain institutions and that they're less able to function on their goals. Um, and I don't disagree with that, but my essential question, though, is um, people have been writing about the downfall of institutions for a very long time, uh, probably, as far as I can tell, preceding at least the dominance of identity thought in American politics. So my question is, do you think institutions have led more to, the downfall of institutions has led more to increase in identity politics or the in, identity politics have led more to the downfall of institutions? Um, well, I think the institutions seem very well ensconced. It's not doing a great job, right? So I think I would frame it a little bit differently. I mean, you know, the CDC's budget is great. It's performance less so. Uh, you know, the New York Times, um, uh, has been tempted in the last years, I think there's some signs of course correction, to just turn itself into a voice of progressive America, its bottom line is doing just fine. I think it's just given up, or would give up if it continues on that path, on what its historical mission in the United States has been. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I guess I would say uh, I don't see the institutions falling apart and therefore identitarianism rushing in. I think the institutions are pretty successful in terms of purely sustaining themselves and commanding large budgets or either for profit institutions, you know, making money. Um, I just think that uh, they are increasingly doing damage to the fabric of our society. And so why do you think there are no corrective mechanisms there? You think if, you know... Well, in part because, you know, if... I mean, anyone can start a newspaper, right? So. Well, there are lots of corrective mechanisms. Yeah. I mean... Uh, not that I'm a huge fan of his, but Joe Rogan now has more listeners than yeah. MSNBC, Fox News, and CNN combined. Uh -huh. um, uh, we are seeing uh, you know, lots of publications go into the space that... Uh, uh, but so then what's the issue? If, you know, is it the original institutions have been replaced already? It hasn't the problem been solved? No, but there's something between... I think mean, it's sort of creating a slightly too stark choice, right? Where either these institutions haven't left the field at all, or we have substituted them. I mean, I run a magazine called Persuasion. Yuval runs a great magazine 
um, uh, you know, there's lots of new entrants on Substack and so on that now collectively have tons and tons of subscriptions and I think they're doing amazing work. But none of them rivals the reporting power, the staff, the global uh, bureaus and all of that that the New York Times had. So I think we should still lament if the New York Times becomes ideologically captured, even if there's lots of uh, great entrepreneurial, interesting ways of trying to fill that void. You've all not, I, I don't know. I always feel like if the institutions are doing so, such a terrible job, why aren't they, you know, why can't well, they? Well, it takes a long it? time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's yeah. the story about the founding of Stanford where, you know, the first president or somebody was one of the original donors said, what does it take to take, you know, what does it take to found a great university and whatever, so, the president of Harvard or somebody responded. Five million in a hundred years. Five million dollars in a hundred years, yeah. right? I mean, it takes a while to, 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 to reconstitute those. Hopefully, eventually we will, right? That's why I don't think, I mean, we have to fight back for control of those institutions and we have to be engaged in uh, building alternative institutions and part to pressure those. And I'm trying to do both at the same time. So let me, let me ask one more, que one more question about nationalism. So uh, one line of critique of the argument you make could be, look, uh, we just have a series of movements that basically all engage in the politics of recognition. Uh, in the you know, 19th century, that was recognition of of, nation, of, of the nation, uh, you know, then recognition of the, the role and position of, of the different sexes came in the early 20th century. And, you know, in many places, not just in the U.S., different ethnic groups started pushing for, for recognition. As you probably know, in Belgium, right, the 1968 student protests were about university instruction in Flemish. Um, and, you know, and maybe this is just, yeah, you know, the next wave. But you have different gender identity groups, different, you know, everyone just wants their own community to be recognized, to be visible. How, how do you think of that as a different framing of the intellectual tradition that has led up to, to the current moment? Is that something you just completely disagree with? Yes, I think there's two okay. things wrong with that story. There's something to the story you're telling. It's coherent in itself, but I don't think it expresses the nature of this new ideology for two reasons. The first of that is that the former recognition movements were successful and effective when they were, sorry to use the U word again, universalist, in the right way. I mean, of course, Frederick Douglass can be described as heading up a, a movement for recognition as well as much else, right? But the form that they took was to say, by what virtue are you excluding us from, whether you want to call it traditional American norms and values, like those inscribed in the Constitution, or whatever you want to say, universalist ideals, right? But what we want is that we have the same rights, that we all too are recognized as being born equal, that we too are treated as equals in this society. Um, I think that's true in the civil rights movement. We haven't talked very much today about the intellectual history, but that makes it very clear how radically people like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw reject the, the civil rights movement and reject left-wing and center-left African-American politicians and activists. According to Derek Bell, the core goal of critical race theory is to move beyond the defunct racial equality ideology of the civil rights movement. Kimberly Crenshaw in 2010, 2011... But that, but that existed at the time of the civil rights movement too, right? That black nationalism was present in sure, the Sure, but the point that's is... New, and that's, that, yeah. that's existed. I mean, it's fused together in a new way, and it's become mainstream. Black nationalism was never what they taught you at Harvard University. Mm. But critical race theory is what you're now taught in orientations at Harvard University. So something that you can say had antecedents, of course, as any intellectual tradition had, but was on the margins of American society and was minoritarian within the African-American uh, African community, has now become the dominant voice within it. And not because all African-Americans have suddenly become black nationalists, but because a small elite faction of mostly white progressives have decided to enshrine that as the dominant voice. I don't think most African-Americans agree with Ibram X. Kendi, but it's Ibram X. Kendi who got $43 million to waste at an anti-racism center at Boston University. The middle initial definitely helps. <laughs> yeah, good, like D'Angelo has a good name too. I feel like they did. Are they? By the way, I don't know. I mean, $43 million, you know, I don't know how, how, how much funding you have for your magazine, how much you need. I mean, we struggle to, for persuasion to raise a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, which we need to publish our articles. Well, so he if, would probably say, if any of you want to help us, please <laughs> tell me. He would probably say, first BU takes 55%. <laughs> Right, and so it's not that easy out there. I'm only left with 20 million. Um, anyway, with that, uh, thank you all for, for coming. I hope this was enjoyable. Uh, thank you to our esteemed panelists. Yasha, thank you, and good luck printing a new 
uh, run of books? Uh, yes, uh, you know, I, I guess at least it means I can say, you know, I, I've sold out the books. That's right. But Thank you.